Hi everyone. Welcome to the library and welcome to the folks at home. Thank you for joining us. I'm Alyssa Downey and I'm the adult and youth services librarian here at the library. I want to thank you all for coming here today and to give a special thanks to Tim Walker and Alyssa Engelman for presenting this program and for all the work they've put into it. Also, thank you to the rest of our staff and volunteers for their support in organizing this amazing event. Last April, Tim attended Peter Filkin's poetry reading here at SFL, and we were thrilled when he approached us about presenting about Sailing to Freedom, and ecstatic when Elisa was able to join him for the presentation as well. Tim and Elisa have, will be discussing a part of the Underground Railroad that, unfortunately, many people are unaware of, and that is enslaved people's use of maritime transportation to make their way to freedom in the North. Sailing to Freedom highlights this less understood way of travel in 10 essays that move along the East Coast from the Carolinas and Virginia all the way to the safer harbors of northern cities such as Philadelphia and Boston. Ulysses' chapter in the book specifically focuses on events along the eastern coast of Connecticut. Please make sure to silence your cell phones and join us in welcoming Tim and Elisa as I turn this over to them. Hi, good evening everybody. I am so grateful for the opportunity to come here tonight. I've just, Stonington is a place uh, that I have visited multiple times since the late 80s. And I, I started sailing on large, traditionally regged vessels at Mystic in uh, 1987 when I was just starting my graduate program in Boston. And I figured, you know, if I'm going to study overseas colonial expansion, I need to know something about sailing. And I grew up in Ohio, I grew up in the Midwest. <laughs> Um, and it, curiously enough, in the tall ship fleet, you find a lot of Midwesterners. And I think that's because they actually don't grow up knowing just how dangerous the sea can be. And so they have this romantic notion and they end up. But anyway, so I ended up in Mystic um, sailing for a little while on the Mystic Whaler and the Mystic Clip Clipper. And we used to come over here to go to Noah's. And so I love Stonington and it's been a, it's been a great uh, opportunity to come back. And uh, my colleague, uh, Elisa Engelman, who I've known since graduate school at Boston University in the 90s, um, and she was sort of a natural person to approach when I started to put together um, this project about uh, the Maritime Underground Railroad. And I started to think about this project geographically, um, organizing the book, uh, moving people from the South to the North in their bids to, to achieve freedom and uh, achieve liberty. And I really wanted someone who knew this area quite well. And Alyssa was the the, the natural person to turn to because she had so long been associated with uh, Mystic Seaport Museum and knew this uh, Stonington and New London area uh, and Mystic area very well. So what I'd like to do tonight is talk us through this. Um, and I wonder, is it possible to bring the front lights down a little bit so that we can get a better uh, view of these? Um... No, I think that's good. Unless, unless do, is that okay with everybody? Okay. Um, the, um, the story of the Maritime Underground Railroad is one that I came to from, um, again, from my, my experience in the Midwest, where I grew up learning a lot about the Underground Railroad, but its terrestrial dimensions. And um, so I grew up um, with maps like this. This is from the National Park Service. And I want to challenge a little bit how this map depicts the Underground Railroad. This is the way it's taught uh, in most American schools. Uh, it's the way that I certainly learned it. But I want to push back a little bit on the way this map conceptualizes and thinks about the Underground Railroad. This map would have us believe that people leave from the very far south, central Alabama, central Mississippi, central Georgia, the Carolinas, central Tennessee, and that they move hundreds of miles by foot or by carriage or by horseback through what was in effect hostile territory to achieve freedom in northern states. And the problem with this map is that the historical record doesn't match what the map says. Uh, what the historical record says is that the overwhelming majority of successful overland escapes that we can document begin very close to a border with a free state. They begin just a couple of days' walk from places like 
Illinois or Indiana or Ohio or Pennsylvania. And so a lot of people are escaping from what is today West Virginia. They're escaping from Maryland. They're escaping from northern Kentucky and eastern Missouri, but they're not escaping by land from the deep central south. And the reasons for that, if we think about it, are pretty easy to understand. It was too difficult. The challenges of being caught, recaptured, re-enslaved were just too high. Most enslaved people didn't have a very good idea of the uh, of the geography or the terrain very far away from where they were working. Uh, they didn't have networks of support that could help them. Uh, so the, the, the problem of organizing shelter, places to stay at night, food, moving with a family possibly, all of this was just an almost insuperable problem to move very long distances over land. By contrast, if you could get yourself onto a boat in one of the harbors along the southern coast, uh, Charleston, Savannah, um, you know, any of the Carolinas, or boats leaving out of the, um, the highly sort of perforated um, uh, uh, coastline of that territory, you could be, if you're on an ocean-going vessel going north, You'd be out in the Gulf Stream, and in a matter of just a few days, you can move hundreds of miles to be with, uh, in a safe and, well, not necessarily safe, but to be in a northern harbor five, six, seven days after leaving from even the very far south. Ships travel 24 hours a day, and they travel five, six miles an hour, over 100 miles in a day. If you're traveling over land, even on horseback, uh, your best uh, rate of speed is going to be maybe 20 or 30 miles in a day. Ships move much faster, and they're much safer, and they're more secure if you can get yourself on board a vessel. So that's the sort of beginning point. But there are some other important parts of this story as well. If we want to understand how the maritime dimensions of the Underground Railroad worked, we have to understand something about uh, the workforce of the southern, um, uh, of the southern seaboard. And one other point, almost every documented escape that we have uh, evidence of from the far south is an escape that happened by water. Of more than 100 uh, slave narratives, people who escape and then later on publish something about their story of escape, 70% of them mention escape by water. So it's a very large part of the story. It's a part of the story that has not made its way into historiography in a very strong way uh, in the 20th century. But um, myself and my colleagues that I'm, that I'm working with, our job really is, is to try to get people to understand about this very important side of the story and to change the way that people think about the Underground Railroad, to include that maritime dimension. In no way to diminish the extraordinary stories of the people who escaped over land. You know, people like Harriet Tubman, who made repeated trips into Maryland to bring people out of enslavement, but, uh, but instead to add to the story these, this rich tradition of maritime escape. So, this is allergy season and I apologize, but... <laughs> Um, all right, so this is the maritime, uh, sorry, this is the Underground Railroad that I grew up understanding. And so here's a, here's a publication from the late 19th century. It's one of the first academic treatments of the Underground Railroad by a guy called William Siebert. He did most of his research by mail, by correspondence, corresponding with people mainly who were operatives of the Underground Railroad, but also some people who had escaped. And so he was able to map actual escape routes. And you notice how Ohio, I grew up near Dayton, Ohio, there. I was born in Detroit, and I, my father was from Michigan, and so we lived a number of years in Detroit. And, of course, that was a major crossover point uh, from the United States to Canada, going through Detroit. But, um, but if you grow up in Ohio, you hear all these stories about people escaping over land from the Ohio River. But notice that Siebert maps the Underground Railroad only in the north. The way he conceived of the Underground Railroad was that it was the people working to help enslaved people to escape, most of them white operatives of the Underground Railroad. Uh, and, uh, and so one of the criticisms of his work is that he's not inclusive. And a big part of our work has been to show that escapes by water depended very heavily on the agency of the enslaved people themselves. 
building on their own skills, their own um, knowledge of maritime routes, their own knowledge of ports and how uh, maritime trade worked in order to get themselves onto vessels and find their way to freedom. And notice that he does include the port of uh, Portsmouth in Norfolk, Virginia. He includes Philadelphia and further south. He includes information about Charleston, South Carolina and some other places too, where there were some operatives who were helping people to get aboard ships. So he gives a nod uh, to uh, the maritime dimension of the Underground Railroad. Another key part of this is that in the 19th century, the entire antebellum period, almost all of the commerce of the United States is moved by water. There's no interstate highway system. There's hardly any roads. All of the rivers that, that penetrate the seaboard, none of them are bridged. You have to use ferries. And so the easiest way to move heavy, large bulk cargo, like plantation-produced agricultural goods, you have to move those by water. And the people doing all of that labor in the South are enslaved African Americans working on the waterfront. So almost the entire workforce of all of the ports and all of the river systems of the southern states prior to the Civil War, there are a few free blacks involved in this, there are some uh, free white people overseeing the processes, but the majority of people working in the ports and the waterfronts are enslaved African American men and some women as well. And this is borne out in the art of the period that you can look at and see evidence of this uh, depicted. But what kind of work are they doing? Well, they're dock and wharf workers, they're longshoremen and stevedores loading and unloading ships, which by the way is pretty skilled labor. You have to know how to load a vessel properly so that its trim is right, it's balanced, and it will sail better. If you load a ship incorrectly in an unbalanced way, it won't sail properly. And so this is pretty skilled labor. Um, they are warehousemen. Uh, they are working as drovers and teamsters to bring provisions and supplies and all kinds of goods into the waterfront. And they are key shipyard labor. They are caulkers. They are riggers. They are sailmakers. They are doing all of the work to keep these vessels afloat and functioning because this is key to the southern economy. This is how the goods that the South produces get in and out of port. So there's that. But not only are they working on land, on waterfront jobs, they're also working on the water as skilled watermen. They are uh, fishermen. They're oystermen. They are uh, ferrymen. They are lightermen. A lighter is a particular kind of large, heavy cargo boat that you use to load and unload a ship that's at a mooring or on an anchor. And so, again, this is highly skilled labor uh, knowing how to safely load and unload ships uh, onto bigger, heavy cargo boats, and then navigate those boats through the pretty tricky water systems of the ports of the South. But more than that, they're also, many of them are actually working on the vessels as deckhands and as um, pilots. They're not called pilots because a pilot is a specialized, skilled job that is a title that only white people assume to themselves in the South. But they are, for all intents and purposes, pilots who know the intricacies and the navigational hazards of uh, going through these very complex river systems and port systems of the South and these tidal rivers. So this is a big part of how uh, we have to conceptualize the, the context out of which people uh, are coming. One of the uh, key captains of the story of our book, uh, Sailing to Freedom, Maritime Dimensions of the Underground Railroad is a guy called Daniel Drayton. And Drayton captained a, uh, a, captained a schooner called the Pearl, in which he tried to flee from the waterfront of Washington, D.C. with almost 80 enslaved people. It's the largest attempt to, to, uh, to, to flee the context of enslavement with a big group of enslaved people. He got caught. But what he wrote in his memoir was that any captain aboard a ship known to be from the north, I'm paraphrasing, but this is what he says, any captain of a ship known to be from the north and the enslaved people are very astute at figuring out which vessels come from the north and are likely to return there. Any captain, as soon as he drops anchor, is going to be approached by people who want to make their way to freedom. And he says it happens again and again and again and again. He was operating mostly in the Chesapeake Bay, but this would have been true of the far south as well.
So if we look at the, the population of enslaved people in the South, this is a census map from 1860, uh, U.S. government map. Uh, the, the deeply shaded areas show where the enslaved population is concentrated. And the most deeply in, uh, uh, shaded areas have enslaved populations of 70 or 80 percent. So the enslaved population is concentrated along the waterways where it is possible to remove um, plantation-produced heavy agricultural goods by water, take them down to the ports, load them on ocean-going ships, and take them out to sea. And that is the opportunity for escape. Because the guys who are, mostly guys, who are doing this work understand the rhythms of the ports, they understand how the, uh, the loading and unloading of ships works, they know where they can hide away, uh, they know when the forces of, in, of enforcement are in the port. They know when the, when the authorities are making their rounds, and they know how to avoid them. And so, uh, over time, this knowledge, this strategic knowledge of the, the rhythms and the functions of southern ports and their waterways gives opportunities for hundreds of people annually to escape. The, in the 1840s, the governor of Virginia estimated that Virginia was losing over $100,000 a year in, in, in money of the 1840s in people escaping by ship. And that translates into about two to 300 people a year just from Virginia. So we can say with pretty high confidence that thousands of people over the antebellum period are escaping by water, but we even have better data than that. So here's another map. This is just South Carolina. You can see where the enslaved population uh, is, uh, is, is, uh, is concentrated. But look at all these tidal rivers and waterways that allow for the, the plantation goods to be drawn out. Anyone who's working in a land-based terrestrial agricultural job, a plantation field hand, doesn't have this knowledge. And the other kinds of knowledge that you get in a port, working on a waterfront, working with ships, working with sailors, you get geographical knowledge. You get cultural knowledge. You get, you absorb through your interaction with free black sailors who are sailing in and out of ports in the South. With, um, and by the way, the work of Jeffrey Bolster in the, eight, in the uh, 1990s, I think 1997, his book Black Jacks come out, comes out. He argues that almost a fifth of all sailors working in the U.S. Merchant Navy were people of African descent. They're black jacks. They're 20% of the sailors are free black men, some slaves who are paying their wages to their owners, but, but they are geographically highly mobile. They're cosmopolitan, and they can convey news, information, knowledge, strategic information to people who want to escape. And this is very important. The other way we know about this is from runaway slave ads. There are numbers of ways that we as historians are gathering information about this. And one of the ways we do it is through run runaway slave ads. Library of Congress estimates that there are about 220,000 individual runaway slave ads from the middle of the 18th century, 1740s, up until 1865 at the end of the Civil War. 220,000 of these in archives and in libraries scattered around the United States. We've done a sampling, and I can't give you exact numbers. These, unfortunately, these runaway slave ads have not been gathered together in a single place and digitized, so you can't do a comprehensive study of them yet, but there's a project to do that. In any case, we've encountered hundreds of these runaway slave ads that reference escape by sea. So a runaway slave ad is placed by an owner or by the agent of an owner, and they usually give a physical description of the person who has escaped. They say what they're wearing, uh, give some important data, but they usually say how the owner suspects the person has got away. And we have several, I've just included a few examples, but there are hundreds of these. Uh, so this is from 1772, quite early. Uh, it's a guy named Phil. He's about 20 years old, stands five foot nine, but he's a sailor. As he has been used to the sea, he will probably endeavor to get on board some ship and make his escape out of the colony. 
All masters of vessels are therefore forewarned from harboring or carrying him off at their peril. So even in 1772, we have people escaping by water and the beginnings of penalties for people who are helping people to escape by sea. And we're going to see this again and again and again. Here's another one, $10 reward. Absconded from the household of the President of the United States on Saturday afternoon, Oni Judge. This is 1796 from Philadelphia. Who's the President of the United States? George Washington. So Oni Judge, a young mulatto woman, uh, part of the household staff that had come from Mount Vernon with George Washington to Philadelphia, she hears that she's about to be sold, and so she flees because she doesn't want to be taken back to Virginia in enslavement. Pennsylvania by this time has abolished slavery, but uh, you could take enslaved people for a period of time, a limited period of time, and then remove them back. And she was about to be rotated out and probably sold, so she runs away. And Washington's agent places this ad, as she may attempt to escape by water, all masters of vessels and others are cautioned against receiving her on board. Well, in fact, she did escape by water. She got on a ship in Philadelphia, went down the Chesapeake Bay, and then up the coast to the east coast of the United States, and she ends up in New Hampshire, where she managed to live out the rest of her days in freedom. But she was never, she dies before the Civil War, so she was always technically legally property. And she risked being re-enslaved if ever she went back south. Washington spent the rest of his life, he dies in 1799, but Washington spent the rest of his life trying to get her back and he was unsuccessful. And she publishes a narrative uh, in, the, in the 19th century that explains why she ran away and how she refused his efforts to get her back. Fascinating story. Here's a broadside, a, a poster that was posted publicly from uh, Baltimore in 1810. Um, this is a man named Jack, five foot eight or nine, uh, calls himself Jack Alexander. His object is to go to sea and will be trying to ship on board some vessel bound out. Note below, all masters of vessels and others are forewarned, harboring or taking off said Negro at their peril. So we're seeing the erection of uh, penalties and legal um, mechanisms to keep this from happening. Most of us know about the Fugitive Slave Act of 1850, which Congress uh, passes and makes it very difficult. It actually becomes a federal offense to harbor uh, a, a person who is legally property in the North. And federal authorities are charged with bringing people back to their rightful owners in the South from Northern states. But there's an earlier runaway slave, uh, uh, sorry, a earlier uh, Fugitive Slave Act in 1793 and uh, this begins to create teeth uh, in the law to charge owners of vessels if they help someone to escape. Uh, here's a fugitive slave uh, ad from 1838, North Carolina, the Wilmington advisor. As very little doubt can be entertained of his conveyance away on board some vessel, I will give the further reward of $500 for the conviction and punishment agreeable to law of the master or captain and half that sum for any of the crew, so anyone who helped this person to escape. Ship's masters, uh, captains, and, and, and some of their uh, officers risked imprisonment, heavy fines, confiscation of their vessel, confiscation of their, um, uh, of their cargo, and being banned from doing business in southern ports if they were caught doing this. They risked imprisonment, and that's what happened to Daniel Drayton. But free blacks in southern ports, Africans in southern, people of African descent in southern ports, for them it could be a capital offense to help someone to escape. So the law doesn't apply equally to people of color as it does apply to people who are of European descent. Uh, here's another one. Um, these are two people, Mary um, and uh, William. Uh, both of them have had for a long time relations with the Negro fishermen of the bayou. So it was suspected, correctly, that fishermen and, um, and some of the waterfront workers and watermen were actually helping people to escape as well. And uh, our colleague who contributed a chapter to the book, um, David Soselski, who's a scholar based in North Carolina, has written a wonderful book about uh, how black watermen were, were actively engaged in helping people to escape to the north. 
The book is called um, The Waterman's Song. Thank you. So this is a great advertisement. I won't belager you with, with many of these, but this is not a runaway slave advertisement. Instead, it's something else. It's a legal notice placed by a captain from New Bedford, a guy called um, William Tabor, 1797. This is in the wake of the 1793 First Fugitive Slave Act that has erected some legal penalties. And what he's trying to do is to establish that he was not responsible for the person of color who escaped enslavement on board his vessel. So I want to read this out for you just so we can kind of read between the lines and see what's going on here. Public notice, to all whom it may concern, know ye that I, William Tabor, commander of the Sloop Union, sailed from the York River in Virginia on or about the 28th of March last, bound to this port, New Bedford. That on the day after sailing, I discovered a Negro on board said sloop who had concealed himself unbeknownst to me. I had nothing to do with it. I didn't know. He just turned up on my ship. And I was as surprised as anybody. That's what he's saying. Is that true? Well, captain's word is law at sea. And, and so he's making the argument that, that he didn't know that this guy was on board. To continue, it appearing in, and this is where it gets interesting, it appearing inconsistent for me to return, the wind being ahead, I proceeded on my voyage and landed him at this port, New Bedford. The weather did not permit me to turn around and take this legal property back to his rightful owner. I don't have an engine. I, the wind is behind me. I have to proceed up the coast. I'm in the Gulf Stream. And by the way, uh, the law in the United States at the time says that once you're three miles offshore, you're in international waters. And so the, the arm of the law, any kind of maritime authorities, only extended out three miles. So within a few minutes, literally, within an hour anyway, depending on the wind, uh, ships are going to be in international waters and can convey whomever and whatever they want without the fear of being uh, interfered with by customs authorities or anything like that. He calls his name James. He's about 27 years old and says he belongs to Mr. Shackelford, a planter in Kings and Queens County, Virginia. Does he really belong to this guy? Is that really his name? We don't know. We have to take the captain's word for it. Any person claiming him will know by this information where he is, for which purpose it is made public in this manner, and every legal method has been taken to prevent the owner losing the property in my power. William Tabor, April 20th, uh -huh. <laughs> uh, 1797, that was not planned. Um, he's covering himself. He's providing himself and his crew and his ship legal cover by putting this public notice in the paper. And the other thing to remember is that this is a weekly publication. And so while newspapers did circulate up and down the coast, and probably Mr. Shackelford would eventually, within a month or so, get a copy of this paper, is it going to help him get his property back? No, because by the time he gets the notice of where his property is, his property could be anywhere. It could be in Canada, it could be in upstate New York could be in any of the communities that were harboring enslaved people, including New Bedford. And so this is a fascinating document that shows us how people tried to provide themselves legal cover. But there were captains who did this again and again and again. Um, they didn't always publish a legal notice, but they were carrying people regularly to the north. Another way that we know that this is happening is that the southern states start to erect laws to control the movements of free black sailors, who they were terrified were talking enslaved black people into escaping. They thought that free black sailors were the agents that were encouraging people to run away. And they knew, the owner class knew, that their port cities were like sieves, that dozens and even hundreds of people were escaping regularly, annually, which represented not only a huge financial drain, because these are very valuable people, but it's also a brain drain, because they're also some of the most skilled and most um, uh, knowledgeable of the enslaved population in the South. So to try to control the people who you suspect are encouraging this outward migration of enslaved people, um, so tech, well, the earliest one is South Carolina, Charleston, we expect that, 1822, 1830 in North Carolina, Florida, 1832, 
uh, Mississippi and and um, and uh, Alabama, Louisiana, 1842, Texas, 1857. All of the southern states. Interestingly, not Virginia, but all the rest of them try to stop. The, and what does this mean? It means that when a free black sailor comes into port, they are confined to their ship or they are incarcerated in the local lockup so that they cannot circulate within the town. And sometimes this means weeks of incarceration. And they risk enslavement if their captain decides he's not going to pay for their upkeep in the, in the jail and sail away without them. Then they can be enslaved, even if they're free blacks. This is an extraordinary uh, uh, infringement of their rights as free citizens. Um, our colleague, by the way, um, uh, Michael Schopner, who teaches in Maine, has written a book about this called Moral Con Contagion. It was the Southerner's position that free black sailors represented a contagion on the morality of their enslaved people that would encourage them to run away. The other way we know about this is by narratives. Um, narratives published by enslaved people who escape and then publish their stories. And we have several of them. Oops. Uh, one of them is by Thomas Jones, The Experience of Thomas Jones, published in 1862 after the Civil War begins. Uh, he, he got onto a, a, a brig called the Bell in 1849. He had been a longshoreman in Wilmington, North Carolina. And he gets to New York, and the captain um, wanted to re-enslave him. So the captain goes ashore in New York to find a federal official to come out and, and, and take him into custody, take Bell into custody. Bell sees his chance. He puts together a raft of just loose boards, probably not nearly as nice as what's pictured here. And he tries to swim for it to get to the, uh, the city of New York where he can find shelter. The first mate and some of the crew go after him, but he gets picked up providentially by two other mariners from the north who have abolitionist sentiments. And they secret him away. He, he gets into the network of the Underground Railroad in New York, and eventually he makes his way to New Bedford and then to Boston, and he publishes his book um, after the Civil War has begun. This is a fantastic story of Elizabeth Blakely, who escapes from Wilmington, North Carolina uh, in 1850. She's only 15 years old, and she had some bad luck because it wasn't a very quick trip for her. She escaped in the winter. Uh, she was at least two weeks at sea. She suffered horrible frostbite. She was, she was stowed away aboard a vessel. And her, her narrative isn't published until 1920. 1920 and 21, but we have her story because she ended up uh, with uh, W.B. Du Bois, who, uh, who published it, uh, made sure that uh, her story was known. We also have stories from abolitionists. So this is um, Austin Bierce, who publishes in 1880 a book about being an abolitionist in Boston Harbor and how when any ship would arrive from the South, they would send a boat out with an African-American woman selling pies and other things for the sailors. And she would discreetly ask the crew, do you have any contraband on board? And if the answer was yes, then they would send another boat out in the middle of the night to take off the fugitive and secret them into the channels of the Underground Railroad where they could find safety. And this is what this is recorded. His large boat was called the Moby Dick. And this is in 1853. So Melville's book had only just come out. And he named his yacht after that book, apparently. So July 18th, 1853. Uh, this is another uh, wonderful uh, book. William Still, who was the key Underground Railroad operative in Philadelphia, publishes a book in 1872 about a record of facts and authentic letters and narratives of the Underground Railroad. He was an operative who ran a safe house near the waterfront in Philadelphia, and he kept meticulous notes. And this was pretty dangerous because what he was doing was illegal and clandestine, but he kept this, um, this notebook and then he, he sort of publishes it uh, in 1872. But there are more than 600 stories of people who he helped, and many of them are escaping by water. Uh, and, and many of the illustrations of that book include episodes uh, on, on ships. So this is one where uh, Captain James Watson Fountain, who had a schooner that was a packet ship, it ran a regular route up and down the eastern seaboard, and he was regularly taking people off. In this one instance, a delegation from the port came aboard his vessel and they wanted to search it. And he seized an ax and he said, I don't have any people on board. I'm going to show you. I'm going to tear up my deck. And they stopped him and they said, OK, we believe you. He had more than 20 people on board at that time. And they all made it to safety. Uh, and so he recorded this story. 
Uh, this is a fantastic image, also from William Still's book. This is offloading people from a schooner at night uh, in Philadelphia at a kind of isolated little island away from the main port. But the reason I like this illustration is that it has so many important components of the Maritime Underground Railroad. Aboard ships, unlike escaping over land, aboard ships you could take off families, you could take off small children, you could take off women, even, even people who probably couldn't travel very easily over land. You can get them safely to the north if you take them by ship. You have African-American operatives of the Underground Railroad, of which there were many. William Still was a, a, an African-American guy. And, uh, and so it's not just white people helping black people. It is um, the African-American communities of Philadelphia, Boston, New Bedford, any of these cities that were actively engaged in helping uh, people to escape. They're putting them into carriages where the windows have been covered so prying eyes can't see in as they're taking them to safe houses. And so all of this is nicely depicted in this, uh, in this image. Uh, just a, I'm going a little over time, so I'm going to try to speed up a little bit. But there are some amazing stories that we've uncovered as part of doing this book. <clears throat> Dempsey Hill, uh, Waterman, Beaufort, uh, Beaufort, North Carolina. Uh, he's essentially a pilot and a waterman in the harbor recognizes as soon as the Civil War starts that he has access to charts that are tremendously militarily valuable to the blockading U.S. Navy from the north. So he steals them from a customs house and he hides them in a cemetery and then he recruits a few of his buddies who are also watermen and they steal a pilot boat and they sail it out to the blockading Union Navy and they turn it over uh, and the charts, they turn the charts over to the Navy. He's immediately enlisted as an able seaman because he has the skills and the chops to do this uh, and he serves out the rest of the war he ends up being a very popular charter boat captain in buzzards bay uh, settles not far from new bedford and when he passes away in the 1890s he gets a full column um, obituary in the boston globe and in other local papers he was so respected as uh, as a as a as a fishing boat and pleasure boat captain pretty interesting guy um, and I, this leads me to, um, uh, talking about New Bedford, and I'll just finish with a couple of words about New Bedford. Um, by the 1840s, we get, uh, runaway slave ads that are referring to New Bedford as a destination. And the reason for that is multiple, there are multiple reasons, but one of them is that New Bedford by the 1840s, of course, is the premier whaling port of the world. And... The whaling business is in the hands of Quakers, Society of Friends, who by the late 19th, uh, sorry, the late 18th century are adamantly abolitionist. So the business of whaling is closely wrapped up with abolitionism. And New Bedford was an abolitionist town with African Americans and, and, and white Americans working to end slavery. It was closely tied with William Lloyd Garrison in Boston and, uh, and lots of activity happening there. So it becomes known as the Fugitive's Gibraltar, where people can run away, find work, find housing, find a welcoming community, and earn wages on par with their white uh, brethren. And so, this is a view of New Bedford at the peak of the whaling days, 1839. It's the year after Frederick Douglass shows up in New Bedford in 1838 and, and makes that his home for several years. Um, but New Bedford is, and, and if you're a waterman from the South, and you have skills working on a waterfront, working on boats, New Bedford is a place where you can make a living doing things that you already know how to do. And there's something else. If you're being pursued as a fugitive, you can sign aboard a whaling voyage, and you can be gone for two years, three years, four years, on the other side of the planet, in, you know, hunting whales in the Pacific. And by the time you come back, probably people are not working are looking for you. So there was always work on the waterfront of New Bedford, and in the art of the whaling business, we see again and again and again that African Americans are depicted sometimes as officers, as a boat steerer, um, and 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 in the in the midst of the crews, there were always a large percentage of people of color uh, who were working uh, in the in the in the whaling industry, uh, and they had a big impact. Uh, one person who was a fugitive from Virginia revolutionizes the. He was a blacksmith. 
He revolutionized the whaling industry by inventing a much more efficient harpoon. Uh, his name is Lewis Temple, and he invents something called the toggle harpoon. And my last person is um, William Carney, who fled by sea from uh, Virginia, becomes the first African-American man to earn the Medal of Honor uh, in the Civil War. He fought with the famous 54th Massachusetts Volunteer Infantry Colored that was recruited partly in New Bedford. So with that, and apologies for having gone over time a little bit, thank you so much. And uh, Alyssa will take it from here, and then we'll be available to uh, answer questions. Thank you. Oh, you didn't. I know. Thank you. Good evening. Um, this is, I think, the third time that I've gotten to hear you speak on the book and the, and the broader project, and every time I hear something new and I learn something new. So thank you, Tim. That was fabulous. Um, and I just wanted to add my thanks to uh, Carla and to Alyssa for having us here this evening um, and to Tim for inviting me to contribute a chapter to this book. Um, I, I am local. I grew up in Ledger, and my first job was as a library page. So I feel very much at home here for many reasons. Um, but as you'll see, I don't have all the answers. And so I'm going to be posing a lot of questions in my uh, presentation. And I'm excited to hear your questions back and probably also some local knowledge I don't have um, that will help me as I continue to work on this research project. So thank you in advance for questions, corrections, and additional information. I am going to be sharing with you a local story um, that I think really um, exemplifies a lot of the things that Tim was talking about for the Maritime Underground Railroad. You'll hear some echoes in my presentation um, in particular. And I'm going to share with you the surviving fragments of a local maritime escape that happened in 1858, so just a few years before the start of the Civil War. And it involved a man who fled enslavement in North Carolina on a lumber schooner. And we think that he was headed for Mystic. So very close by. It's a story that came to light as part of a bigger research project that I inherited from an older generation, a previous generation of researchers at Mystic Seaport where I work. Um, and as a public historian, I am always standing on the shoulders of giants. But I had some really amazing people who started this research long before me. And so it builds upon the painstaking work um, and careful documentation over the past 30 years by curators, researchers, librarians, interns, volunteers, and students, including some local people who you might know or you might recognize their names, like Bill Peterson, Andy German, Bev Gregg, and uh, youngsters, uh, Michelle Slater and Bridget Hall. So I'm indebted to them. We shared, even though we didn't all work on the project at the same time, um, we shared a passion and a desire to learn more about the people who lived and worked and passed through a part of Mystic called, at the time, Greenmanville. You might be familiar with Greenmanville Ave um, and Greenmanville, really important, interesting neighborhood. And I'll show you some pictures of what it looked like uh, closer to 1858. And we were interested as well in the larger threads that linked these people to economic, political, and social events on a national and on a global scale. And of course, the Maritime Underground Railroad is a really important example of that. So we tracked down some questions, and we generated a lot more answers. The way that people in 1858 first heard about this escape was through the newspaper. And so here's a brief notice in the New York Times from October 4th. I'm going to read it out loud. Um, it includes some language that is no longer you know, considered socially appropriate. So I'm just going to replace that term with a word that appears later on. Um, so if you're reading, reading aloud, you'll notice when I do that. It tells us that a fugitive slave case occurred in New London, Connecticut on the past Friday. A coasting vessel arrived from North Carolina with a fugitive on board. The captain, discovering the man, went ashore at New London and apprised the federal officials who went to the vessel. But the man had taken alarm, jumped overboard, and swam ashore 
guess he didn't have raft material handy. Collector Mather of New London, who was the customs official, instituted a search, found Joe concealed in a clothing store, and captured him. But Dr. Minor, a local official and politician, interfered, advised the man to run, and he did. The collector got out a handbill offering a reward of $50 for his arrest, but the man escaped and is supposed to be on his way to Canada. So like so many of those hundreds of thousands and thousands of escapes that Tim mentioned, um, it seems like a pretty straightforward case. The fugitive discovered on board a vessel, um, he's taken into custody eventually, makes his way um, to freedom, and that seems to be the end of it. So it's a successful maritime escape in the end. But we probably wouldn't know about it if things hadn't gone awry along the way. And so it's fortunate for the fugitive that he made his way to freedom, and it's fortunate for us as researchers that things didn't quite go as planned um, because we have this newspaper article and many others about this same case. And there aren't just one, there isn't just one newspaper article about this escape. There are more than half a dozen. It appears in uh, Garrison's The Liberator, an abolitionist newspaper. It appears in Southern newspapers. And they don't all agree on the details. So when I taught this course at University of Connecticut, Avery Point, the students were really fascinated with the inconsistencies. Some of the cases mentioned that the fugitive brought a jug of water and a ham to sustain him on that voyage. Others say that it was cheese and crackers. Um, some call him Joe or Benjamin Tebow or Benjamin Jones. We, never, we don't know to this day what his actual name was. I call him Benjamin Jones because local newspapers called him that, um, and those are the ones that seem to have the most accurate detail. But I fully recognize that he may never have been called that name in his lifetime. We, don't, we didn't know, um, but we do now, the name of the vessel. In some cases, it was called the Eliza, and we know now that it was named the Eliza Potter, built in Noank, and ran out of there on, uh, on coastal runs. We also, the students in particular, were very curious about where the vessel was actually going. Was it going to New London, as the New York Times tells us, or was it headed somewhere else? And the Connecticut newspapers tell us that it was probably headed for Mystic, not for New London. And so you probably know uh, Mystic in the 19th century, a major shipbuilding town that really punched above its weight in terms of its size. There were six major shipyards just in the first mile of the river um, as you came up from Long Island Sound. And they were making hundreds and hundreds of vessels uh, during the antebellum period and into the decade just after the Civil War. You see here a 19th century image of the river uh, Long Island Sound is at the bottom. Well, you see the railroad bridge, so Long Island Sound is behind us. At the very bottom, you see the railroad bridge, um, and then you see the uh, bridge for wagons, for pedestrians, and then at the very top, in the red circle, or the red oval, you'll see Adams Point, and that's what it was known at the time, and that is now the location of Mystic Seaport. In the 19th century, it's where two major shipyards were, the Mallory Yard and the Greenman Brothers Yard. They were located on Adams Point. And when we started doing research to try to figure out which shipyard that vessel might have been headed to, the Mallory Yard and the Greenman Yard seemed like really strong possibilities for us because of the building projects they had going on that summer and fall in 1858 because of how many projects they were involved in, and because of the number of uh, lumber schooner deliveries they received in general um, over time. So to give you an example, the Greenman Yard produced more than 100 vessels between 1837 and 1878, a span of just about 40 years. Um, and the peak, of course, for the building of wooden hulled vessels really happened during that antebellum period. So they were getting a lot of deliveries from the South. Here's a ship being built just after the Civil War at the Greenman Shipyard, but it really is indicative of what would have been happening decades before. You can see the raw, um, uh, the trees in the foreground, and then the hull of the vessel in the background. 
it's difficult for us when we look around Connecticut and see, or New England and see all the beautiful trees to think about why anybody would bother to go down all the way to Savannah or Charleston or North Carolina for more trees. But it really has to do with the types of um, wood that they needed for the ship building. So although oak was often used for the frames um, and the keel, uh, the planks and the inner finishings of the vessel were often longleaf southern pine which was stronger and also more flexible than the varieties you can find in New England. So it was absolutely worth their while. And the number of trees that they needed for large projects like this was, um, was almost insatiable. So there's a very strong economic tie uh, between New England and between the coastal south because of that. Not just for the wood, but also for the turpentine, for the pitch, for the tar that you need to complete and to repair wooden hold vessels. So there was constant trade. Um, I think there were an average of almost three deliveries a year, usually in the spring or summer, that came from Wilmington, from Savannah, from Charleston, to the Mystic River. Not to New London, not to Newport, not to New Bedford. All of those were also receiving shipments, but that's just to Mystic River itself. So there's frequent trade going on. As Tim has already mentioned, for those captains of those vessels, it was very high stakes if someone found a fugitive on board. Here's an example from a newspaper article in the 1830s of a captain of a vessel out of Maine who is accused of kidnapping a freedom seeker. And a reward has been placed on the, his head and on the head of his mate, $500. So the captain of the Eliza Potter, out of that no ink based vessel uh, on which Benjamin Jones was a passenger, a stowaway, not quite sure. Um, we can understand a little bit better why that captain would have cut short his voyage, anchored off of No Ink, and taken the time to travel to New London, where the nearest federal official was, to say, I have a fugitive on board. You need to come take him off my vessel. I need to be able to continue trading with Wilmington. It's not something morally that feels comfortable to us or right, um, but we, we can understand, I think, a little bit better the economic forces at play. Um, when we see the examples like $500 or being imprisoned or losing your cargo. So what would Benjamin Jones have seen if the captain hadn't found him, hadn't stopped in no ink, if they had continued up the river to either the Greenman or the Mallory Yard? Where was where was he intending to go? Where was he thinking that he was going to land? Who was going to help him? As Tim mentioned, if you're in a completely new state with no connections, it's very difficult to travel to get a passage on a coach or a carriage or a train or to walk and know where you're going. There was almost certainly someone in the community who was ready for him to arrive who would have helped. We know this from the patterns and from the uh, accounts of the fugitives themselves. So if we imagine ourselves in his position, in the, if that voyage had continued upriver, one of the landmarks he would have noticed was the Greenmanville Seventh-day Baptist Church. You might recognize this, although it's in a different location at Mystic Seaport Museum now, and it's been turned 180 degrees. So the front doors now face the water, not the road. Uh, but this was right nearly on the, on the property line between the Mallory Yard and the Greenman Yard. And it was a very important part of the Greenman neighborhood. Um, the Greenmans were very devout. They um, contributed greatly to the building of the church. They attended every, uh, every Sabbath. Um, they hired the minister. Um, and they really uh, supported the work of the church, which was built on abolitionists, founded, I should say, on abolitionist principles, um, and had a very fiery minister who spoke out against slavery every chance that he got. Another reason why it was really important for the neighborhood is that it was a Seventh-day Baptist. So much like other mystic Baptists, um, the Greenmans and the other parishioners did not believe in drinking. They did not alcohol, drank other things, but not alcohol. Um, they didn't believe in dancing. Um, they did support women's rights. Um, and they also believed that Sabbath happened on Saturday. So whether you were religious or not, if you worked in Greenmanville, 
in the shipyard, in the mill, in the store, you had Sunday off. Sorry, reverse that. You had Saturday off. And no, I got it right the first time. Yeah. You had Saturday is the Sabbath. So you have that off, whether you go to church or whether you follow your own pursuits. You are working in the shipyard Sunday. Thank you. Um, what this means is that there are accounts of the Greenmans and the fellow parishioners sitting in this church on a Saturday, and the Mallory's right next door are launching a vessel after many months of, of building the ship. And even the minister stopped, and everyone went rushing to the windows um, to watch their competitor, their neighbor, um, their fellowship builders, you know, magnificently uh, slide the ship down the ways. So they're already living to a slightly different rhythm than other people in Mystic. And I would argue that this also makes them a little bit more willing, I think, to stand up for abolition. Connecticut at the time, believe it or not, was not uh, the most um, active abolitionist state in, the, in, the, uh, in uh, New England, um, but the Greenmans definitely were. So uh, Benjamin Jones would have seen the church. He also would have seen on the east side where the Greenmans, their uh, foremen, their workers were living on the shore. And when my students see this photo from a couple decades after the Civil War, but the structures that you, the major structures you see here, were all here in the 18, late 1850s. My students are often struck by all of the outbuildings, right? The chicken coops, the sheds, the barns. Um, and by thinking about, wow, there are a lot of places, actually, if you can get past this marshy ground in the foreground, there are a lot of places that you can hide temporarily or be hid um, while you're awaiting help getting further north. Um, and so it's a reminder of how closely people lived to the water and how, as Tim said, how porous um, many of these ports and coastal towns were to the water, to the road, um, and to uh, further networks. Now, the house on the left, um, you is still there, um, but you can't see it because right now it's obscured by trees and by other buildings that have been moved to the location, which tells you probably a hint, big hint right there. This is on the grounds of Mystic Seaport Museum, and this is the front of the house today. So the George Greenman House, which is part of the museum, um, this was built in 1839, and um, we don't have any evidence that Benjamin Jones and the people who lived in this house met, had any contact, or were aware of each other. Um, but there are some really interesting parallels between his stories and the family, their activities, and their, and their stories about themselves. So I want to talk a little bit about that. George Greenman um, was the Greenman brother who lived, built the house, lived there with his wife Abby and their family. And he and his two brothers who co-owned and ran the shipyard um, took some of their maritime profits and definitely devoted them to uh, ending, trying to end slavery without resorting to war. Um, but they were pretty uh, adamant about how important it was. So on a July 4th public debate, they stood up and they defended John Brown and his raid on Harper's Ferry. Um, they gave money every time somebody came through seeking uh, funds to help missions in Canada for fugitive slaves or subscriptions for the Liberator. They hosted feminist and abolitionist uh, Lucy Stone in her house when she showed up on the railroad in pantaloons rather than a skirt. They still took her in um, and uh, you know brought her to the Baptist Church downtown and Old Mystic Church to give her talks. I believe on weekdays she talked about feminism and women's rights and on weekends she lectured against slavery. So she, William Wells Brown, and a number of other abolitionists passed through our area and were hosted by the Greenmans. Let's see. They also, in addition to raising money, um, they wrote and were active on a national scale with the Seventh-day Baptist um, uh, church, its organization, and its activities. And yet, they were definitely deeply entangled with slavery. Um, through the maritime economy and through the activities that paid for the house, that paid for the supplies, that paid for the clothes and the food um, on a daily basis. So 20 of the ships that the Greenmans built in the 1830s and 1840s alone 
were made for use in the southern trade of carrying cotton. And in a number of those cases, they remained invested. So they built the vessel, the vessel left and started transporting cotton, and they remained as investors receiving revenue back from, those, from the sale of that cargo. So they're economically profiting from the cotton trade. As already noted, they and their um, fellow shipyard owners also contributed to the slave economy by purchasing raw materials, the southern pine, the turpentine, the pitch, that were almost certainly harvested by, loaded onto ships by enslaved laborers in North and South Carolina, Georgia, and Northern Florida. So the watery lumber highway along the coast that brought Benjamin Jones almost to their doorstep also supported the very system that had enslaved him. And I think that as Northerners um, and as descendants of Northerners, it's really important for us all to remember how sticky slavery was and how nearly everyone um, was in some way involved um, in it because it, it was not an easy thing to separate from um, morally or economically. Okay, so where does that leave us? We have two different stories going on, two different fragments, Benjamin Jones and the Greenmans. And I think that um, how we think about it and the link between the two has a lot to do with memory and a lot to do with family. So even as the Greenmans are a very strong uh, family with three brothers and their wives living next to each other, cousins running from house to house, um, family memories getting passed on about Lucy Stone, uh, about um, you know the the speakers about the activities, Benjamin Jones himself is entirely severed from his family, whatever family he had when he leaves. I ha we haven't been able to track him. We don't know if any of his descendants still carry family stories or memories about his escape, um, about his life in the South, or what it was like to move to Canada. Um, but we do have some of those Greenman stories that we know. And a lot of that is because of a woman named Mary Greenman Davis. She was the last Greenman descendant to live in the house, the George Greenman house. And she lived there into the early 1970s, which is quite remarkable. So it stayed in the family from 1839 until her death in the 1970s. And she told stories in the 1960s about her family, her ancestors, George and Abby, and how they would welcome in fugitives from lumber-bound schooners from the South, hide them in outbuildings or cisterns or this cabinet um, in one of the parlors, which um, has a recessed area behind it, and that they would help freedom seekers on their way. There is no documentary evidence of this. There's no physical evidence that anyone ever hid in this tiny cabinet or that it ever held anything other than the family silver or maybe booze during prohibition. But the stories, the imagination, the visual of this was so compelling that when she told this story to a young white teenager who was cutting her lawn, he remembered it. And when he returned to Mystic Seaport later in the late 1970s after her death, he wanted to learn more. And he started to do research. And he started to expand his research beyond the house and the family and their shipbuilding activities to maritime history in general. And that person was Bill Peterson, who since um, has been uh, an author, a curator, a researcher who has really um, influenced me and also generations of, of maritime historians and um, public history people. So that story that he learned as a teenager, whether it was true or not, sparked off his interest that then lit a number of different fires over the generations, which means for me that even if the Greenmans never played a role in the actual physical escape of Benjamin Jones, the Greenman descendants and the stories they told about people like Benjamin Jones helped to reclaim his story, helped to keep interest alive in researching it and finding out more about him, about people like him. And so in a way, they kind of rescued us <laughs> from some of those um, assumptions that Tim was talking about, the stereotypes of what escapes looked like and who was involved and who was an agent in it. So we don't have any private family papers. It's very difficult 
to um, unearth any more family evidence about this. Um, as I said, I would really love to know more about the Benjamin Jones aspect. Um, and you might be wondering as well, what happened to him? This person who passed through our territory for less than 36 hours, did he leave any trace on where we are today? He didn't leave any remainders, but there are a couple reminders of what he went through. And one of them is this plaque that was installed in 1991 through the sponsorship of the New London Day. And it's on the New London Customs House, the very place where Benjamin Jones was held um, until the local activist convinced the customs official to release him. Um, you'll see here that uh, they call him Joe again. Um, don't really know what his, what his actual name was. Um, and that tells very briefly the story of him. Um, and that's still there. So the next time you're in your London walking around for dinner or visiting a vessel, taking a train, take a gander over to the customs house. I think, um, Tim, you probably like this building in particular because it is an exact uh, co copy. It's not a copy, but uh, this building was built from the same plans as the customs house in New Bedford. Um, so there's a nice uh, connection there as well. How do we know for sure what happened to Benjamin Jones? Well, we have to go back to those sources. And if you remember the New York Times article in the upper left, it uh, stated in October that he escaped and is supposed to be on his way to Canada. Um, my students found this later newspaper article from the Hartford Current four months later and um, repeating that he's presumed to be in Canada. They also found a much shorter notice that confirmed that he was in Canada and had been reunited with his wife and young daughter. Um, so that is a great conclusion. It's also kind of tantalizing to think about what his life was like. Was he a waterman to begin with? Um, what, what did he do after he got to Canada? Um, and uh, is there evid any evidence up there? So if anybody's headed to Canada and wants to do a little research, um, I'd be happy to pose some questions. So I think in conclusion, um, although it sounds a little fragmented, and when we were talking about the chapter for the book, I kept saying to Tim, I don't have one story, I have two. I'm not sure how they knit together. And he kept encouraging me to think about the connections between them, but also the fragmentary nature of any escape on the Maritime Underground Railroad. There are always more questions than answers. There are always inconsistencies that's part of being a clandestine experience that was illegal um, and that over the generations, memory has changed, faded, um, new memories have been added. If anyone is interested in doing more research on escapes from this area, I wanted to let you know that Mystic Seaport in our research library, um, we've purchased a copy of the William Siebert uh, microfilm that is in Ohio. So you remember William Siebert in 1898 is one of the first researchers, one of the first historians to publish about the, Mar uh, the Underground Railroad in general. And as Tim mentioned, he did, he collected his information through correspondence with former uh, fugitives, with uh, people who were engaged in the Underground Railroad and with their descendants, because of course that first generation was passing by the 1880s, 1890s. So we have microfilm that has correspondence with people in the Stonington area, in Ashaway, in Hopkinton, in Westerly. Um, nothing that relates specifically to Benjamin Jones, which is what I was looking for, but you might find some references to family members, to um, neighbors, um, or to others that you're interested in. And so you're welcome to come to the um, Mystic Support Research Library, make an appointment first, but it's free. And if you're interested in doing a little bit more research, that microfilm is there. So again, I wanted to end with um, thank you. Thank you to the Stonington Free Library and the staff. Thank you to Tim. Um, and thank you for your questions and your um, observations and suggestions going forward. So I think I'm going to invite, invite uh, questions. Yeah, if we have time. Great. Thank you. And I guess for those online, we can pass the mic back and forth if, we, yeah, if we need to. That works. Um, yeah, so just open it up to questions if, if folks want to ask, or uh, we're happy to respond. Why do you think some of the little 
you want to take a stab at it? So, my particular story or in general? <laughs> yeah. So Tim is the maritime historian, so he's going to know much more of like the theory behind it. But I think in general, as I think in general, in the last 50 to 80 years, we've really lost touch with our maritime roots as a daily activity. Those who are in the service are certainly aware of it. You know, people who fish or are involved in transport are aware of it. But on a daily basis, I think most Americans don't feel connected to the water the way that they used to. And so it's not part of our kind of national consciousness and thinking about it as a highway um, and as the prime means of transport and travel, um, the way that ideas and goods and people um, traveled, um, the way that, you know, a lot of us do because we live in a in a coastal area. But I think that in the greater American consciousness and maybe for historians as well, put off maybe by a little bit of maritime jargon. Um, you know, there are a lot of historians who don't tackle maritime topics if they're not maritime historians. So that's my best guess. But no, I think I would agree with all of that and, um, and add maybe that um, for those of us whose lives revolve almost entirely on land, the sea is a foreign place it's it's sort of exotic and and um you know even i live in new bedford massachusetts now and i have for almost 20 years many of my students come from coastal communities but unless they're the children of fishermen they're completely disconnected from the water they just don't think about it very much and you know as soon as we have uh the development of our highway system and now airports and airplanes and people don't think about the fact that even today, 90-something percent of our commerce arrives to the United States by water through the ports on, on either coast. Um, but the other factor, I think, is that the training of historians in the 20th century moved away from maritime themes. And so you don't have a lot of scholars, uh, particularly scholars of, um, of the Civil War era, of slavery and enslavement. Uh, that that do a lot of work with maritime documentation. And so they're not aware of the kind of riches that you can get by looking in the in the extraordinary preserved documents that exist in places like Stonington and Mystic and New London and New Bedford, all of these places where uh, for a century and a half, right up until World War I, really, um, we were very closely tied to the movement of our economy depended on the water. And um, that's um, that's gone from living memory now. So I think that's the big reason. So. Other questions or comments? Don't be shy. Oh, oh yes, please. Uh, I, I've done a little research myself, and I thought it was real interesting the, uh, the maritime connection. Uh, it went both ways in the sense that when uh, David Walker wrote a book called uh, uh, the, uh, the State of Appeal. Appeal. He was from Wilmington, North Carolina, mm -hmm. and he ended up in Boston. And when he wrote his appeal, he had it smuggled into the South right. by boatmen right. uh, shipping out of Boston. And it would show up in Savannah and Charleston and Wilmington and yeah. all those places. And it was largely distributed by uh, 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 black boatmen yep. uh, on the river. Yeah. It's a, a very complex story, a very fascinating story that really needs a lot more attention. Yeah. I'm so happy to be able to attend it. Well, just to add a bit of detail to the ex absolute accurate thing that you said, but another component of this is that Walker was a supplier of clothing for mariners, and he would sew his his illegal document into the clothing that uh, of the of the sailors to whom he sold it, and then they would take it to places where it would be confiscated if it was found. And that's one of the reasons why they passed those laws. Precisely. Uh, if you notice a couple of them were 1829 and 1830, that's when the book was approved. That's right. The other one that I noticed is that in South Carolina, it was uh, passed in 1822. That's yeah. the same year as Denmark, Fiji. And, and that's, that's correct. That's exactly it. This is my son, everybody. Um, hi, Sebastian. Are you going to join us? Right. Uh, if anyone is interested in, in buying the book, we have copies available. Uh, yeah, there are. Right. 
we should, yeah, and I should have said this at the outset. I had the great privilege to work with some really skilled and wonderful historians, creative scholarship, young people at the beginning of their careers, people towards the end of their careers, men, women, black, white. We've got a wonderful collection of people who worked on this book. Uh, and and so um, we are representing them in a way, and um, and we don't want to steal the, uh, the 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 credit that they deserve. But uh, that said, if you'd like a book, we'll be happy to sign it, and uh, we'll sign for them as well. <laughs> so. Thank you.